Welcome to the Shark Tank Podcast. Each week, one of the best entrepreneurs from ABC's network smash hit Shark Tank teaches you how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, T.J. Hale. Today we're going to switch gears just a little bit, and I love doing this. We've got a guest from Marcus Lemonis's The Prophet. You may recognize him from the season premiere of season four. This is Travis Lee, the man with a plan behind the scenes of Farrell's Ice Cream. Travis, welcome to the show. How are you? Great, TJ. Thanks for having me today. Hey, it's an honor. You guys really knocked it out of the park. I'm always curious what they're going to do for the first episode of every season, and uh, you didn't disappoint. So uh, thanks for entertaining us and educating us. Uh, it was our pleasure. It was uh, really something special to go through this process, and then an even bigger reward to have Marcus choose us as the as the premiere for for season four. So it was clear. So for those who don't watch The Prophet, first of all, what's wrong with you? Let's start watching The Prophet. All right, this show is awesome. If you like Shark Tank, you'll love Marcus's show. But for those who maybe didn't watch the episode or uh, don't remember it. Travis was the employee turned co-partner. And this happens every now and then with Marcus, kind of his signature move. He brings someone on into the partnership to give more equity into the company. And that was Travis. And the reason I want to have you on is I'm always interviewing the founders or the owners of the company. I've never had the opportunity to interview someone in your position. So I kind of want to get your perspective on how that all came together and also make sure that they actually did give you a contract and you've got some equity in the company. And that wasn't just for us. Uh, good TV. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I sure do. I, I have uh, have equity in the company now, and it, it was, uh, to to say the least, something very very unexpected, and and something that truly blessed my my myself and my family. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of people in my position that go to a company because they truly believe in the, the core foundation of what a company stands for, um, and you give your all because that's what you do for a company you believe in. And to to go through this process, and at the end of it, have Marcus recognize me, and um, I guess appreciate what what I've done for the company, and to to bring me in as a partner um, was, was something special and something you know I never expected. Are you married, Travis? I am married. How long before you called your wife after that? Like what? Hell, about three and a half seconds, nanoseconds. You know, <clears throat> It, it was fun. I, I'm married and I, and I have, a, have a daughter. So I called my daughter right away and, and, and told her. Um, she's 11. Her name's McKinsey, and, and she was stoked. Um, I kind of sat on, sat on the news a little bit until I got home because I wanted to, to tell my wife face-to-face, -face. Um, and it, it didn't disappoint. I mean, there was uh, uh, tears both ways. I mean, it's just – it's neat. You know, it's – I think – for me, my my wife has always been been my biggest fan and and been alongside of me as we've made different career moves and to to be able to go home and and share with her that all my hard work, all the sacrificing of family events and and family time has has really paid off with something pretty special. I'm I feel the way I do when I watch the show. I'm kind of just like. After the show was over, social media was doing what my wife and I were doing in our house. All it was is a chorus of Travis, Travis, Travis. And uh, I wanted to get your – there's always that cynical part of me that says maybe this is just TV. Maybe this isn't really how it went because we're seeing this a lot on the show. And I wanted to get legitimate, genuine feedback from you about the, the real life effect because I can only imagine your wife sitting down with you. And Does she work? She's staying at home? Uh, she she does work. She she's a she's a pastoral secretary. Okay. And uh, you can imagine it at her office. And that's the 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 biggest thing is is this is something that we lived for, you know, almost six months, and where we couldn't talk about it with anybody. It was all going on behind the scenes, and and she was forced to to be my my bouncing board because I'd come home and what I would normally share with friends or you know mentors of the past is. Now she's the only person that can know what's going on because you know we had to sign all these confidentiality right. paperwork and and so the, once the show aired, I mean it was just like the floodgates open. I'm I'm a little bit old school and and never been super big fan of, fan of social media. So the night that the show aired, uh, Shauna, who is also featured a huge part of the the show, kind of 
helped me get going on Twitter and and <laughs> and LinkedIn. And I, I mean, it was it was overwhelming to see the the people that kind things people had to say about me. And then what I never truly expected was since the show has aired, I, it, it seems just about everywhere that I've gone, I've, I've bumped into somebody that recognizes me from Ferrell's and from the show and has a million questions, you know, what happened? And, you know, congratulations. And I've never, I, I've never lived anything like that. I never expected any of this stuff to happen. So it's, it's been pretty neat. So Shauna took your social media training wheels off, huh? Set you free. Yeah, she did. Uh, you know what, if you've gotten a million questions, then maybe they've done my job better than I could. What are some of the, uh, the most, what are some of the most prominent questions or experiences from the show that you've shared with people? You know, the, the, the number one question that, that we, we run into is, um, when Farrell's first came back, we were, um, you know, we, we have a, we have a longstanding brand and Marcus kind of explained it on a TV. You know, Bob brought this company to us in 1963 and we, we touched lives until Bob gave it up in the eighties. Um, Mike and Paul brought the, brought the concept back to, in, in early 2000. And when we first opened, I mean, it was just lines out the door and just completely chaotic to even try to get into. Well, the, the lines died shortly after, but the perception never left. And so people still remember, you know, the first, year of of Farrell's coming back and it's well you guys have lines out the door and you know how could you guys possibly need Marcus's help well the lines died and people because people had that perception I I think really led to you know some of the situation we're in because people weren't coming because they were afraid they're gonna have to wait in line and so having to explain to them that you know the lines are gone and we needed business and we needed we need Marcus to help us grow and move forward and, and kind of just bringing people to the reality that, you know, it's, it's a long ways away from the first year that we opened. And then as I understand it, I'd read that after the stores closed, the found, the current founders actually, there was a movement to open the store in the mid nineties. Were they involved with that or was that somebody else? Like it got left on the drawing board. Um, it got left to, there, there's been a couple of different, um, companies that, that tried to get Farrell's going. Paul and Mike ultimately did. And the, Bob and Ramona Farrell, um, Bob passed away a little over a year ago. Ramona is, is still with us, but they were always, um, involved in what Mike and Paul had going. Okay. Um, the, the, the connection that, that Mike and Paul and, and Bob Farrell had were, was almost like father son. He met him, he fell in love with him and he pretty much handed them everything from his original business plan down to the wallpaper. And anytime Farrell's made a, a, a big move or a, a big decision, uh, they ran it by Bob and, and Bob blessed it or, or gave his opinion on it. And so it was up until Bob passed away. I mean, he was a very, very proud man of what Mike and Paul were doing with the concept. And it was a, it was a, it was a positive involvement. Now, um, I'm curious because obviously there were some things that weren't working. So was it mostly aesthetic? I mean, from the operation side, I, I would be curious to know how much he was involved in that. But we only know what we saw on TV, right? I don't go to Farrell's because I live in Arizona. So uh, maybe we can get more into that as, I, as this evolves because I want to know about getting on the profit. You talked about it being a six-month process. Were you active in the, in the process of getting on the show or did they just come to you one day and say, hey, guess what? We're applying for this show and fingers crossed. Tell all your friends to pray for us, that kind of thing. You know, about about a year ago, Mike Fleming, um, who's the CEO of our company, um, came to an executive meeting and said, "You know, look, guys, here's here's the the long and short of it. We we need help. We are we are financially struggling. Um, pretty much every avenue we looked down was was a dead end for us." And he said, "I was up last night and um, I was watching the profit, and I went ahead and applied." And I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know if we're going to get accepted, but this might be the saving grace for our company. Interesting. Did you know what episode he was watching when he applied? You know, I don't. Um, he, he's, a, he's a huge fan of Marcus and a huge fan of the show, so I, I don't think he misses very many. Um, and then sure enough, I, it must have been a month or two months later, we got a, Mike was notified that, that we were at least considered for it. And so we sat down um, – with the producers and did Skype interviews and they interviewed everybody in our, in our company from 
Mike and Paul to me, and I mean, just kind of just went down the down the road, and then it was um, a lot of nothing for for a long time, and then we we finally got word that hey, we could be filming, we could be filming as soon as next week. <laughs> get and, the broom, uh, so get the like, brooms and the Windex go. out. Uh, it's I'm picturing you doing Skype interviews and Mike standing there as you do it one by one. Like I don't know if you've ever seen Happy Gilmore when Ben Stiller goes. <laughs> Like, don't screw this up, Travis, or else. You know what? Um, the way the way Mike came across on the show is, is um, so far from from who he is, and and this is the, the honest truth. When when we first applied, when we did the Skype interviews, and even when we were finally chosen to go on the show, Mike Mike set us all down, and he said, "Look, it, I've made a lot of mistakes as we built this company, and I understand that there's a very very good chance that I could end up being." the bad guy when it comes to to how this show is pro- it's gotta, portrayed yeah gotta be a bad guy be a at villain. the end of the day i want you guys to be 100 percent honest and if that means you have to tell them that i am the cause of this company and it cost me my job then so be it he mike is the one that, that had the vision to to bring ferrell's back he found an old ferrell's coin and then completely devoted his life to to bringing ferrell's back and i think even if it cost him his career with Farrell's as long as Farrell's comes back to its greatness I think at the end of the day Mike's going to feel like he accomplished his dream and I think it's extremely important for him to to leave a legacy behind to to Shauna and to to people like me and to to our future cast members so you know he was extremely encouraging for us to be honest and open and not to not to hide anything and and he was willing to sacrifice everything that he's dreamed of to to make sure that we were portrayed as an honest up, up front company. And, and I think we did a pretty good job of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And, and i I like the fact that he did that because I mean, I've been doing the shark tank podcast for long enough to know that things aren't always as they seem on TV. And Mike took a little bit of a beating on the show. I mean, he was redeemed by the end, but how did he feel afterwards? Was he okay with it? Um, yeah. I mean, we, I wasn't, I was really lucky. Me, me and him and Sean were able to get together and, and, and watch it together and, and, to, to see him be redeemed at the end by Marcus made me feel very good. And at the end of the day, he's walked away and felt like he gave Ferrell's the best fighting chance that he can. And, you know, we're, we're moving forward in a positive direction now. So I think he's pretty happy with the, with, with the outcome. Yeah, if, if Ferrell's truly was the only goal for him, then he must be pretty happy because it, uh, it was mission accomplished, in my opinion. I thought it was a great episode. Um, in terms of, okay, let's talk about Paul real quick, just because you said you get recognized now when you go out, do people still think Paul is Jeb Bush? Because when I was looking at him on TV, I couldn't tell the difference. Like, shouldn't he be, what's he doing in California? Yeah, I I think he has a whole bunch of autographs ready, signed and ready to to hand away. But no, uh, you know, Paul's, um, Paul's are, are, are the strong silent type and, you know, definitely behind the scenes guy. And, um, him and I, I, I think, struggled the most with, with the with the camera. Um, you know, Mike is Mike's old school Hollywood. You know, he spent time with uh, Jerry Lewis on the ter- telethon and has been in lots of movies and, and helped a lot with with Hollywood. Um, Shauna belongs on TV, and, and yeah. here, here here Paul and I are. Um, and, you know, just kind of walking just, around we're, like we're behind, yeah, we're behind the scenes type of guys. So I think. Oh, uh, shoot. Okay, we're all good. Nothing's broken. <laughs> Sorry. Good. No, I, I think uh, I think he's he's recovering for, from TV. I know he's gotten recognized a couple times, and um, I, I I think everybody's ready for for us just to get back to normal business a little bit. Right. And uh, is is it back to normal? Or are you guys still seeing a huge uh, wave, tsunami, as we call it, on Shark Tank from the show? Tell me about um, that. We're we're still seeing um, a little bit a little bit of a tsunami. It's, it's starting to get back to normal. You know the the really awesome thing about CNBC and the profit is, um, I think our show, shows aired like eleven times now, and it continues to air. And so Wait, um, you just aired two weeks ago. You've been on eleven. Oh, is it just playing? Yeah, it just plays. I, I on, DVR on a it, right? Loop. Okay. Okay. Wow. And, and so, which is you know great for us. I mean, it's we couldn't ask for anything better. Wow. All right, so let's talk about the actually the show recording and the behind the scenes. First of all, um, I asked what episode Mike had been watching because I don't know if you still watch The Prophet, but last night someone got absolutely slayed. Right, it was the uh, soup market. 
Yeah. I thought it probably wasn't an episode like that that would inspire people to to submit an application. But man, was it entertaining. Is is Marcus has he told you about his evil plans for world domination? Because it's very clear to me now he's cross pollinating these businesses and at some point he's just going to take over. He's like a happy Dr. Evil. Has he shared any of this with you? Because it's abundantly clear to me that's what the plan is now. You know, he he hasn't shared his, his uh, complete uh, structure with me yet, but uh, hopefully someday. So are uh, you white labeling Sweet Peats or are you carrying their brand in your store? Because I saw that they're all over the website, which is genius. Again, he's taking over. Yeah, you know, we're, we're really, really lucky. Allison and Pete have um, been a major part in this rebranding of, of Ferrell's. And so they're, they are branding Ferrell's uh, candy for us. And so they are creating some amazing uh, chocolates and Ferrell's branded candies um, at their location in Jacksonville and selling it online. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it was, you know, I've seen the Sweet Pete's episode and was – obviously jealous that I didn't live in Jacksonville <laughs> or close enough to, to get it. Um, but it's truly, truly, I mean, it's one, some of the best candy I've ever had. And so what they're, you know, they're most famous for is their cubes and their sea salt caramels and oh. their, their fine chocolates. And now we have all of that stuff in our Ferrell's locations um, with the Ferrell's brand on it. And then I think on the back, it says, you know, made by sweet Pete's. And I think it's going to be a great, great partnership. I mean, they, they totally belong in our concept. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as they start talking about selling candy, I'm thinking, well, I'm two guesses who that's going to be. Uh, but okay. I thought on this, I got a, a gift bag from them after I interviewed Pete, which is fantastic. Love the guy. I'm not a huge caramel fan, but those sea salt caramels, like I could see myself if I was a criminal, like I could rob the bank or I could rob the Jacksonville, Florida sea salt caramel factory. I'd go for the factory. They are awesome. I, if I came into Pharaoh's, I think I'd just take the barrel and be like, how much? Give me the barrel. They, I really mean, there. they're melting your mouth. I mean, they're seriously some of the most amazing caramels I've ever, ever put in my mouth. Now for me, the, the secret is, and, I, and I'll share with your, with your listeners, if you get a chance to come visit us, if they have a, a candy called a peanut butter melt away, that is like pure heaven. Peanut butter melt away. I haven't tried that one. I'll have to get on that. Yeah, it's it's amazing. All right, and I do plan to come out there, but if I do, I'm going to shoot you a line because I hopefully you're there. You have to be there on the day I go. So we're absolutely, gonna... and we'll give you a little behind the scenes tour. Oh, right on! I'll have the camera ready. Cool. So let's see. Um, uh, when you're filming the profit, how long does there's always these things of okay, well, I'm back two weeks later, and let's go up to this location. I think you had one. Was Rancho still open then, or was it Mission Viejo? You guys went somewhere else. I just don't recall where it was. So we we got we filmed um, a majority of our show between Ranch Cucamonga, which is no, no longer with us, Brea and Buena Park. Buena Park. That was um, Buena Park is the store that uh, we ended up remodeling. And um, yeah, so we we kind of bounced around and got to to take a few field trips in between. But those are the the primary s- stores we shot at. And then how long does the shooting process take with all the traveling and the befores and afters? I mean, how long is the, how long is it? I think all said and done, we filmed, um, not continuously, obviously, but we filmed over the course of four months. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, in terms of things that were left out of the show, you know, are you during the day, are you going back for your bachelor one-on-one interviews continuously, or is it just like an interview here an interview there? And then the most of the footage gets shown what what is your overall perception of that um for the most part it was um pretty fluid and natural i mean they they kind of brought us into they tell us okay today we're going to be in in brea and we would go to brea and you know we still had a company to run so we were still feel we were still conducting normal business and as they needed us they would kind of pull us into a situation now the the one um thing that kind of surprised me and with no prior TV knowledge is Marcus actually was very fluid and natural in the business. And, you know, he didn't think twice about stepping in or getting involved. And, you know, what you see on TV is pretty much who, who Marcus is. Uh, he's, he's hands on. He, he wants to understand the business. He's not afraid to get in and be involved in, in the companies that, that he's taking partnership in. And he, it was, it was pretty neat to see that he wasn't, you know, afraid. He wasn't just standing on the side saying, oh, let's make this happen. As things happen naturally, he would, he would be involved. Give us an example, like something that you recall. Um, you know, one of the, 
walking around and, and talking to guests, um, he just, you know, he, he walked around like you would see a, a restaurant manager in the, in the building. And he, he truly took it on like he is now one of the owners of the company and he treated the business as such. When, in one of the, when we were in Ranch Cucamonga, one of the scenes was him and I in the kitchen. And I mean, he put on an apron and he was, you know, involved with the food and, and looking at the food and touching the, the cooking process, which, you know, you don't get to see a lot of people do. You know, the kitchen's very intimidating for a lot of people. Yeah. And he just kind of jumped in there and was, wanted to understand the business as best as he could in a short time. The one where he walked around, you see that occasionally where he'll just walk up to guests say, hey, what do you think about this and that? And when that happens, the viewer, the uninitiated is like, well, that seems pretty obvious, right? If you're the manager, just walk up and say, hey, do you hate this song that they're playing? And then the whole process changes immediately. And I always wonder, are all the employees sitting there going, see, finally somebody said something? Or is it, uh, I think you were the one who said, yeah, they just don't come back. I mean, it's like a, it's like a known unknown. Why hasn't this happened already? Yeah, it's, um. For 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 our case, it it's dealing with history. Um, you know, I think we 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 came to a crossroad where history of Farrell said we did this, and you know we we've been so afraid to to tarnish Bob's legacy and to to change what people perceived Farrell's as that we were afraid to make some of those tough decisions and get rid of it. You know what we what we failed to see, and what we what we what we chose not to see, is that the consumer's changing, and because of that, you know, unfortunately, it, despite what Bob's legacy is, and despite what they did in 1963, you know, we have to make some t- some tough decisions to to mat- meet the, what the consumer wants today. Yeah, I mean, and that's when when you said we have to run everything by Bob. I think well, you know, Bob used to shop at Montgomery Ward, so there's always a that's. It's a tough position to be in, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. Well said. Uh, in terms of working with Marcus, how involved is he now going forward in the company? Does he, you know, how often is he giving input to you or to the founders or just have a presence there? Or are you guys kind of left alone to manage what's been built now? No, Marcus and his team are, are extremely involved. Um, down to pretty much uh, daily phone calls as we, as we're trying to get this, um, get this moving in the direction that the future sees it. Um, and, and we have some really neat, exciting stuff coming up on, on, on the horizon. Um, marketing, um, Shauna and, and, and the marketing team are, are working and in, in, in daily contact. And then operationally, we're in weekly phone calls and, and, and meetings. And, and they've been out to California quite a few times to, to make this thing move in the, in the right direction. I mean, lots of new menus and new products and it's it's pretty exciting. I mean, it's all hands on deck right now. I noticed on my YouTube channel, a lot of people are asking about Marcus's team because when he goes in, it's all <clears throat> Marcus. And then they'll show people come in and renovate and do interior design. And obviously there's a lot of people behind the scenes. How big is that team? Um, you would think it would be thousands deep as much as stuff as he's involved in. And, and it, it's extremely, extremely small. I think um, the the food team is 10 or 12 people deep now. Um, on Marcus's it, side, not on the yeah, side. yeah, okay. and it's a it's a very small, tight knit team. That um, I mean, it's great communication and, and, and great leadership. It's no Marcus in a, in and of himself is is truly a genius. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my whole life, and the people that he surrounds himself are are not much different. I mean, they're great, great people at what they do. And then that was. One thing I'm very curious about is having been through the process, work with Marcus and been on the show, what lessons have you learned about efficiency in marketing and operations and other areas would actually help entrepreneurs that can't work with Marcus? I mean, what things are you doing now that are obvious that you should have been doing before, but you weren't? What have you learned from it? You know, for, for me, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm fairly young. You know, I'm still just under 40. And I think the the biggest lesson that that I took away from, and it's it's hard, and I've made the mistake in, in lots of other companies, is you have to put the right people in the right places and and trust them to do their job. And I think that's what Marcus does better than than anybody is he he finds the right people, he puts them in their place, and, and he he lets them do their job. Is there accountability? Of course there is. You couldn't have a successful business without accountability, but you know. 
I think for a long time we we as a company spent um, micromanaging each other and um, our processes. And now with with Shauna in her position, um, and for me not to have to worry or be involved in any marketing because that's not my it's not my niche. Right. Um, makes me free up to to be able to do my job and and really focus on operations and getting these new products rolled out. Um, and, and Sean in the same way, I, you know, for so long it was, you know, I had to go to every marketing meeting. Well, th- that's gone. And so he, he really pushes that aspect of it. And, you know, he, like me, he, he gets people that are interested in, and capable of their job and he, he gives them a little bit of skin in the game. And I mean, I can tell you not that I wasn't 110% involved in convinced that this was going to be the rest of my life anyways. But it, he, gra- he, he, he forced me to grab another gear by uh, giving me some ownership in the company because now I, you know, I have a real future with it. And that's something I was very curious about. You mentioned, and it made the final cut, that you had a really good job. And I've known a lot of restaurant managers from previous times in my career. They're always super hardworking guys and gals, not always paid that well, long hours. What made you decide to make the jump to Farrell's? Was it all nostalgia? Was it the potential? I mean, how did that happen? You know, I remember um, Farrell's as a kid. Um, I used to go to one in in Montclair, California, and we had a lot of birthday parties and a lot of great memories there. It was just always something that kind of stuck in the back of my mind. Um, I was working for for Hilton at the time, and um, I loved it. And I always joked with my wife that the only place I would ever leave Hilton for would be Disneyland or Farrell's if they ever came back. And then, and then Farrell's came back. So, so one day on a whim, I just applied and, and the rest is kind of history. But the biggest reason for me was, um, I felt like I was going through a career, a career that I love and, and I'm glutton for punishment when it comes to this career. But, um, I love the, the hospitality world. I love the restaurant world and, uh, food. I mean, it, it's not hard to tell by looking at the, watching the show that I, that I really enjoy food. Um, but I felt like I wasn't able to give back to, to anybody and places like Farrell's is, um, just you're, you're part of people's lives. And I, I get to go home every day and know that I impacted somebody's life in a positive way. And that's a, a neat thing. I'll tell you a, a real quick story if you have time for Please. it. But my, my very first day on the, on the job, I, I trained in the Brea location and I was, when you train in a restaurant, you usually start in the kitchen. So I was in a, in a feral shirt and had been cooking all day long. And I stopped at Vaughn's to, to grab some, some orange juice for my wife. Cause she wasn't feeling well. And this guy approached me in, in the grocery store and says, are you going to be here for 10 minutes? And I said, no, I said, I'm just grabbing some orange juice. He goes, well, you work at Farrell's, right? I said, I sure do. He goes, just wait 10 minutes. I'll be right back. So I kind of shopped around for a minute. It's a little as shifty. I'm, as I walk out, he will comes walking in and he hands, he, fans out um, probably 15 uh, pig trough ribbons is which this little ribbon that we give away if you eat one of our giant Sundays. Okay. And he proceeds to tell me how he won. He, he earned all of these ribbons in um, 1973 and how Farrell's was so much fun for him. And, and as I was driving home that night, I realized that if I had to go home and find something that meant a lot to me from a month ago, it'd probably take me all day to find it. And this guy was able to run home in 10 minutes and grab something from 1973 that had that big of an impact on him. I mean, that kind of instantly solidified the decision that I made to, to come to Farrell's. Wow. That is, oh, I thought you were going to say he had him like in his car from 1973. Yeah, no, he had him at home. He ran home and got him. But I mean, just, it's just, that's the type of the atmosphere that Farrell's provides to our guests and to our employees. And I mean, it's, it's a pretty neat place to work. Yeah. And not only, I mean, I feel like in some ways you've won the lottery with the way things have panned out, but the, the fact that I think one of the psychological triggers of the show is that so many people see themselves in certain characters and the ones that go to work every day, hoping that they can make a difference, hoping that they can make their mark on the company and that it'll mean something. They look at people like you and say, I'm Travis, this is me. And someday I hope to be acknowledged for my contribution. So I think that's what Marcus really gets right on the show is promoting people like you the gal from Key Lime Pie that I can't remember her name, uh, we say, look, you're working around the clock and you're not expecting this. So this is why I'm going to give it to you. You're an owner now. And I, 
Uh, between that and the part where you went to the restaurant supply store and started like kind of pointing to everything and putting it in the shopping cart like it was a shopping spree, I thought that's got to be nice for Travis. Yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take. Can I? Yeah, you mentioned Disneyland. That's probably like your Disneyland, right? I'll take two of everything. <laughs> yep. Back the truck up. Is there anything else from the entire experience that um, I, I kind of want to add on to the question I asked earlier about Farrell's going forward? Like Marcus mentioned yesterday that there are 56 franchises of Simple Greek that were sold in four months. That is unreal, right? That's all part of this master plan. What's the expansion plan with Farrell's? What's the long-term goal? Uh, long-term goal is, yeah, we definitely want to be in a situation where we can start franchising and bringing Farrell's to um – the, the people of the, of the, of the world that, that want it. And, and there is a, a big push to get ferals back into, to a lot of cities. Um, right now we're, we're back to basics. You know, we're, we're redoing our entire menu. We're turning into a, to a scratch kitchen. So if you were to come to Brea today, you would see some fresh cut fries. Um, we've gone and got some new, um, uh, vendors when it comes to our beef so we have a, a brand new ham- hamburger that we're hand tatting that is made um strictly for us it's natural beef and it's a it's a tri blend of some amazing meats um doing our sauces um really trying to figure out what our concept looks like going forward and then once we get this all figured out which you know hopefully won't be too far from now we'll be um looking to build a concept store and, and, and get Farrell's primed and ready for some franchises and to reach out to the rest of the country. All right. Well, if anyone from Tempe, Arizona is listening, get that contract ready. All right. We need a Farrell's out here. Uh, Travis, you haven't disappointed today. You've been a great guest and I'm, uh, I'm just really happy for you and the success that you guys have had. And uh, hopefully we'll get a lot more episodes like that on the profit. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, thanks, CJ. I really look forward to coming to California and giving you that tour. All right. I'm going to take you up on it. All right. Man, thank you. Thank you for jumping in to the Shark Tank Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and head over to sharktankpodcast.net to get the show notes from each episode and join the free Shark Tank Insiders list. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shark Tank Podcast and on Twitter at Shark Tank PDcast. I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in.